let's get started. Welcome to the 2018 school year and English AP. And if you're somebody else out there in the interwebs stumbling upon this, hope you enjoy. We're going to talk about Jane Eyre. We're just getting started with that. And I've got some Beethoven playing in the background. I think we're going to turn it off. It's a little too distracting, but I did want to play it because this is the the sort of mood, the the spirit of of the Romantic era that we're we're getting into. And uh, Charlotte Bronte was representative of sort of being on this this cusp of introducing and embracing ro romantic sensibilities. So um, I do want to talk about that and some of the things that inspired that specifically. Um, and there's some very strong clues in the very first couple of pages of the book that give us an outline as to Charlotte Bronte's artistic influences, things that really shaped her artistic vision. And correspondingly, the same things that Charlotte Bronte is inspired by that influence her, things that influence her writing, um, the same kind of process is happening with her protagonist, Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre is um, an autobiographical rep representation of Charlotte Bronte. And so there's going to be a lot of parallels between the life of Jane Eyre and the life of Charlotte Bronte. Now we know Charlotte Bronte is a writer, a poet, and she's an artist in that sense. Jane Eyre is an artist in a more visual sense. She loves to draw and some painting and watercolors, I think. And that's the way that she expresses her inner processes. So it's very important to, to look at that aspect of Jane and to see how that shapes the novel in so many different ways. Okay, here's a passage I, I want to show you from chapter eight. Now, it's not really that much of a spoiler alert. There, there will be um, a cause for spoilers coming up. So I want to warn everybody, when you find out some of the answers to the mysteries that are going to go on in the novel, please keep them to yourself. If you've seen it in, you know, the theater or, you know, on Amazon, or if you've read the book already, please keep, keep what you know to yourself. But I will reveal this one thing in chapter eight. Um, and Jane is describing an experience she's having. You know, she's, she comes, we find out from a, you know, she's, she's an orphan um, raised by um, an aunt and some cousins and a couple of different caretakers, but she eventually gets sent to a school for orphans. Not very good living conditions, pretty squalid. Um, always hungry, poor food, poor nutrition. So she spent a lot of time fantasizing about food and if she could eat something, what would it be? And that's the uh, what we see here in this this little piece of text. She says, that night I'm going to bed, I forgot to prepare in imagination the barmicide supper of hot roast potatoes or white bread and new milk, which I was wont to amuse my inward cravings. Barmicide supper, there's a footnote in the text. Um, basically, this is the, the classic. I know you've probably all seen it where, you know, somebody sees this table set with wonderful food and they go and they sit down and they think it's going to be a feast. In fact, this happens in The Tempest. Those of you who read The Tempest last year, the, the same thing happened where um, they sit down and it turns out like it was an, all, an illusion. So, um, you know, Jane Eyre used to like to fantasize about food, um, but something's changing. There's a new craving that is emerging in Jane at this point in the novel. And she says, I feasted 
let me get the cursor here. I feasted instead, figurative language here, because you can't feast on something you can't eat, but she metaphorically feasts on the spectacle of ideal drawings, which I saw in the dark. All the work of my own hands, freely penciled houses and trees, picturesque rocks and ruins, of birds picking at ripe cherries, of wren's nests enclosing pearl-like eggs, wreathed, misspelled, wreathed about with young ivy sprays. So here we have her describing images, ideal drawings that she wants to create. And at night she's thinking of these creations that she wants to bring to life. There's a tremendous amount of vitality, of hopefulness here. Um, and so I just want to put that, you know, front load that a little bit because we see the inklings of, of this artistic inclination um, coming up early in the novel, which we're going to get to in a minute. I also want to call your attention to the kind of things that she's interested in, in drawing. Picturesque rocks and ruins of birds picking at ripe cherries, wren's nests enclosing pearl-like eggs, etc., ivy sprays. If you're um, going into these images and visualizing them, there is a little bit of a common theme we see here. Um, there's a lot of uh, veg vegetation, you know, the ivy, the nests, and birds, um, picturesque rocks and ruins. Okay, these are all subject subjects that the Romantic era was very much interested in. And if you remember anything from the Romantic era, if you had Brit Lit last year, or even if you're just getting introduced to it, the Romantics were all about a, a return to nature in, in the sense that it, we have neglected to appreciate all of the mysteries, the sublime, all of the, the magical stuff that's happening um, in the natural world. You know, and some of the magic is starting to be explained by science, but it's still nonetheless sublime, worth paying attention to. There had been a privilege in the intellectual climate, the Enlightenment broadly conceived, which came before Romanticism, in which logic, reason, um, and also a, a placing of humans above the natural world as in you know you go outside in the woods you're going to see all this death and rot and decay and um, things killing each other and chaos and stench okay humans are slowly rising out of that and pretty soon we will be you know the gods of our domain um, this kind of fictional notion of, of progress through scientific advancement and logic and civilization okay and the romantics were like wait a minute let's not get rid of all that good stuff um, and there was a whole artistic movement geared towards re-exploring this wonderful sublime mysterious um, beautiful intriguing um, enrapturing subject matter that you find in nature Okay, so young Charlotte or young Jane, there was no Google images, there was no Instagram, Snapchat, you know, all that stuff. Um, but we do know that Charlotte and her sisters, um, which are, maybe we'll learn a little bit more about, about them, the most famous one being Emily, who wrote Wuthering Heights. Okay, but we do know that they were very keen on a book that they had in their household and when they were when they were young they they spent a lot of time poring over the pages of a book called uh, a history of british birds um, by a guy named thomas bewick who was one of the sort of forerunners or the the 
what's the word of, you know, uh, the harbingers of the Romantic era and the subject matter that, that the Romantics like to explore. All right, so you might be asking, and I hope, you know, points if you are, history of British birds. Um, oh, darn it. Slide. Okay, yeah, history of British birds. Why is there a gravestone? And sort of barren landscape here, uh, but no birds on the title page. Okay, yeah, good question. Um, my answer to that is that Bewick is trying to cultivate this sort of somber, um, sort of a gothic, emotional mood. And there's a there's a headstone here as a, as a sort of reminder of this ever presence of of death within within life so where are the birds and what do the birds mean okay let's look on to some more images from bewick's history of british birds and specifically images from this book that jane mentions very early um jane doesn't have much in the way of, of recreational activities. I mean, you get the sense that she was lonely, neglected, okay, but she did very much enjoy sneaking away into a little window seat covered by curtains with the, this big old book in her lap. And she would look at these pictures, which were woodcuts printed with, with ink. Okay, Mr. Carruthers may have gone through that process with you guys because he's very accomplished wood woodcut artist um and that was how they were able to mass produce these drawings and uh, and publish this this type of book um full of, of different drawings um so we know that jane liked to spend time alone and sort of get herself into this sort of mood of, of bewick well let's see if um Yes, okay, now this resolution isn't the best, I apologize. Um, this is one of the, uh, what, what are called vignettes that we see in, in Bewick's pages. And there's really not um, much text that accompany the images. Um, it's meant more of like to evoke a mood or to maybe even tell some kind of story. Um, a story, though, that the reader has to kind of infer on his or her own imaginative scale. Um, so, you know, it, it's a good exercise, and you can, you know, take a minute, pause this if you want, and ask yourself, um, what, what are we looking at here? Um, be as precise and as literal as you possibly can. Um, try not to interpret too much yet, but just note what it is that we see here um, as if you were just making a purely physical um, literal description so you know take a minute and, and and think about that and then now i'd like to show you what what jane's comment is um on and i i don't know specifically that this is the the image that she's writing about, but I'm, I looked through the, the Bewick's History of Birds. I'm pretty sure this is the one that she's talking about. She's talking about this one vignette here, and she says, I cannot tell what sentiment haunted the quite solitary churchyard with its inscribed headstone, its gate, its two trees, its low horizon, girdled by a broken wall, and its newly risen crescent attesting the hour of eventide. So we should be wondering, little young Jane, probably maybe eight, I think we have to look into the text a little bit more. She's looking at this image. It's, it's evoking a very strong feeling and she doesn't know what it is, but she's attracted to it, intrigued by it. 